my mum. This photo was taken at our wedding. My mum has since passed away. But my mother left a really strong imprint on my life. Very strong. My mother wore, um, grew up during, the World War, during World War II in Poland. And of course, some of you may, may know or have experienced some of this yourselves even, but the thing is, during the war times, nothing is ever easy. And my mother was a young child at the time. She would share with us many stories of her childhood years. I remember one of the stories was that, that, that you were not allowed to take eggs or butter across from one part of, part of the county to another. And my gran her, her grandmother, my great-grandmother, lived in one part and, and they lived in another with her parents. And one of those days, the, the soldiers were coming past and she was actually carrying some eggs and butter from home. And they could have shot her then and there, but they actually picked her up and took her to where she was going. Amazing. Amazing. That is God right there, I think working in her life but my mother was the oldest of five children and being the oldest meant that she was required to do the chores and look after the other children her youngest brother is 15 years younger than her we're very close with him my, un my uncle and I it also meant that my mother didn't actually complete school she only went as far as grade 6 in school and instead, she would often look after the cattle out in the fields. <coughs> and in fact, she shared with us a story not long before she passed away that for three years at one stage, when she was actually looking after the cattle in the fields, she, um, she would read the Bible out loud. That's how she would pass her time while she was looking after the cattle. And so she was born in, a, in an Adventist time. My grandfather was originally a Catholic, had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian in his early younger years. And my grandmother was also an Adventist. And so my mother grew up in an Adventist home. And so Jesus was displayed to her in the home, but it was through work, reading God's word at these times out loud too that she really fell in love with Jesus. And in fact, she knew the Bible word for word in so many ways that when she was in the nursing home towards the end, sadly we had to put her in a nursing home because of her, 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 her condition. But when we would read the Bible out loud to her, she would actually say, ah, but you were meant to pause there, there's a comma there. Ah, there's meant to be a full stop there, you were meant to stop there. She knew her Bible so well. We joked afterwards, you know, with her at times that there must have been quite a lot of holy cows out there because she would read out loud the Bible while she was, of course, looking after the cattle. And so this is how she came to memorise the Bible. But it was my mother's love for Jesus that was reflected to us as children in who she was. In who she was. She was not one thing here or another thing there. She was, she was the same to everyone. And what I loved is that my mother reflected Jesus not only in the home and in the church life, but in her community. So we had a big veggie patch and my mother would actually grow veggies and flowers. And it was very common for us to see mum taking flowers and vegetables to almost every single neighbour around the whole street and around the corner. My two older sisters and I grew up also having family worship in the morning briefly and then a more solid family worship at night time. And so it was a regular thing that at seven o'clock in the evenings, even right into our university and college years, that everything would pause at home and we would gather together to study God's word at seven o'clock at night. My mum had a solid prayer life but it was her daily sacrifices and her unconditional love and so much more in that space that reflected Jesus 
to myself and my sisters. And it was those sacrifices that were seen and unseen. Seen and unseen. And her words of wisdom. And as a single mum that came later in our years, she would work three different jobs to get all three of us girls through private schooling, through the Adventist school. She would get up at 4 a.m. to light the fireplace so that the house would be warm when we would be getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to study. That was my mother through and through. And she would say to us, I didn't get to finish school, but I would do everything possible for you to have your schooling and do what you chose to do. The love of a mother. And she would make healthy, special healthy lunch boxes that my friends at, at high school and at university and even into my work years, yes, I did my lunches in when I worked, but mum would still sometimes make them and I would still have colleagues joking about how they would see a whole garden from my gar mum's garden come out of the lunch box. That was my mum. Sacrifice, love. And her greatest desire and passion was the salvation of her children. And she reflected God in every way. And the Bible is full of stories of motherhood from beginning to end, as I mentioned. And each mother reveals God in different ways. Each story shows us God's heart in different ways. And so today we're going to explore some mothers in the Bible who do exactly that, who reflect and reveal Jesus to us and they can still be seen through our mums today. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, as we dig deeper, Lord, we pray that you will continue to reveal yourself to us right here, right now through the women that we study about. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 2. So we've got Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and then we've got Exodus, Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. And the name of this mother isn't mentioned until Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. But in Exodus chapter 2, we, we find out about this mother. And so the first one that we actually see is the self-sacrificing mother. She was a self, she was a childbearing mother, and her name is Jochebed. Jochebed, the sacrificial mother. And when we look there, we see in verse one in chapter two of Exodus, a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So this woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful child she hid him for three months and verse 3 then go, goes on to tell us where she hid him where did she hide where did Jochebed hide this male child where did she hide him <coughs> what does your bible say in the rushes in the rushes. rushes the bull rushes that's right and in, in, in the reeds by the, the river bank. And so here just some background to this story is this. That Pharaoh, who was ruling at the time, had actually requested that the male children that were born were actually killed. Were killed. The females were able to live, the, the males were killed. Of the Hebrew children, of the Israelites. Of the Israelites. But here we see a mother not following that and what she does is she actually hides this child in a basket. We've many times maybe read the Bible story and seen that this baby is in this basket and put in bulrushes. And who then finds this baby? Who finds this baby? It's Pharaoh's daughter that finds the baby. And what we find is if you keep reading the story then, 
um, it's it's actually this child sister, and of course we we then find out that this child, his name become it, it becomes Moses. He is Moses, and actually this his sister. In verse seven, it says, "Then his sister, who was looking on, said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you?" And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. She called the child's mother. What a beautiful thing that even though Jochebed actually sacrificed her child, not knowing what would happen but hoping and knowing that the Pharaoh's daughter would come and bathe there, was hoping that this, her child Moses would be saved. And that's what happens. And the beautiful thing is in that, that the Pharaoh's daughter then says that for her to look after him and rear him until he gets old. And the child grew in verse 10, it says, and then she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. So she called his name Moses saying, because I drew him out of the water. And so Israel's deliverance began with a woman. Israel's deliverance began with a woman who, self, who was self-sacrificing, who sacrificed her own child, not knowing what the future might be. She had strong faith when she put that basket in the river. And even though she sacrificed her son, to a degree she still got to experience that full joy of motherhood by bringing him up. Yet at the same time, knowing that she would need to let him go at some point. But what was on her mind was that he would live. That he would live. You know, the interesting thing is that the childbirth in ancient world at this time was not easy. Normally it was in a crouching position or kneeling. There was no comfortable beds like we have of going into a hospital like, we, like mothers would experience today. But they were normally in a crouching or kneeling position and small stools, stones or bricks were used to support the woman's weight in childbirth. Imagine that. Stones and bricks around you while you're giving childbirth. But it was because of the sacrificial, her sacrificial motherhood that the Israelites found freedom as God chose Moses to be the leader of the Israelites to take the man out of Egypt and into the land of Canaan and, 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 to, and, and towards the promised land. And so how is God reflected through Jochebed? How is God reflected through Jochebed? Well, firstly, God's love for humanity came through self-sacrificing love revealed on the cross so that you and I will be saved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might be saved. How else is God reflected or revealed? Jochebed's name means Jehovah is her glory. Jehovah is her glory. In other words, God's glory. And so Jochebed's name was not just a name. She lived that. She reflected that Jehovah was her glory. As he is and can be your and my glory today. And the third way that God is reflected or revealed is that Jochebed desired to save her newborn son and son. And God desires for all of his children, not just the one or two or three or the occasional ones, but he desires for all to be saved. So who is our second mother? The second one is Hannah. Hannah, the praying, faithful, consecrating mother. The mother who was also 
barren. Barren. Turn your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel. So keep going further past Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then we go further through a few small books and we come to 1 Samuel. And we go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're not going to read all the verses, but I'm going to touch on a few. And then we've got 1 Samuel chapter 2, and then particularly verse 26, as well as chapter 3. And here we see the mention of Hannah. And here we, we, we read in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Samuel, it says here, Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, a Zophim of the mountains of Frame, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, and son of Eliku, <clears throat> the son of Tohu, the son of Zupa, and an Ephronite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the other one is Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. She had no children. And if we jump down to verse 5, it says, But Hannah would have had a double portion given to her by Elkanah when, things, when the offering was, was coming, particularly when, also when it was um, the, the offerings in the temple. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord had what? The Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed her womb. How many, how many ladies, how many, how many women are out there today who are barren, have tried having children, but have not had children? And how many have experienced that barrenness in a different way? Maybe the womb's not closed, but situations have come across that they may not have married. For whatever reason, may have not found the right partner in their life to settle down with, or may have, and it hasn't turned out. And for whatever reason, they may be single again. Whatever the reason, there are women who are, have not got children, but would have dearly loved to have children. And Hannah was one of them. And so we find then as she go, as we read that story further, she prays. In fact, in verse 15, we say that she poured out her soul before the Lord. That's what she says to the priest. And she says, she says, I'm not drunk, but I have been praying because I'm pouring out my soul. And the interesting thing is then she makes a vow. We see that in verse 11. She then in her prayer to the Lord, she then made a vow in verse 11. And she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but you will give, give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord. How long? For how long? His whole life. His whole life. <clears throat> Imagine praying that you want a child, you will then carry that child, you will feel the movement of that child in your body, you will then deliver that child, go through all the pain birth, and then you're prepared to let him go. You're prepared to let him go. And then we find that in verse chapter 2 then, she goes on, she then, of course, we read on, sorry, in, in the rest of chapter 1, that God grants her wish. In verse 20, she conceived and bore a son. She called his name, who? Samuel. Samuel, because I have asked him from the Lord. Because I have asked him from the Lord. And then the story goes on that she then weans the child. She then weans the child. And then she takes him and leaves him at the temple. And that is where he is for the rest of his life, following God. And he becomes the last prophet of Israel. From this mother, Hannah, she becomes the last child. So he becomes the last prophet of Israel. And interestingly, she's a Nazarite. She is from Nazareth. Here is the picture when we were there in 2015 with my husband 
and we travelled with um, um, 30 other Aboriginal folk, for those of you who know or may not know, my husband is Aboriginal. And so we travelled with, with, with 30 other Adventists, you know, to Israel and we went in the footsteps of Jesus and here we have the sign of Nazareth today and here is the, um, there's a small village where they, where they replicate what it would have been like during Jesus' days. And so she was a Nazarite, Hannah was from there and, and, and why, why are some of these things about Hannah significant about her making a vow, being prepared to, to give her son to the Lord. And why, why are these things so significant? Well, childbearing was, of course, a sign of God's blessing. We find that in Psalm 127. And the inability to have a child was seen as a punishment in those days from God. And so that because of that, when a woman didn't have a child, there was social stigma attached with barrenness. And so she was often ostracized and was considered, she was considered to be um, of lower status. And so an extension into, of the family into the future was highly important. But if you did not have a child, a male child, then that extension, that continuity was, take, what was broken. Children were often relied upon by their parents to care for them in their old age, to prepare proper burial when they would die, when the parents would die, and to carry on the memory of their parents. And why was the vow important? Well, the vows in most of the ancient Near Eastern cultures were voluntary. Voluntary. And they were also conditional. In this case, in Hannah's case, it was voluntary. And so it's significant because she was then following some of the custom. And most common context of a vow was a request made to deity. So in this case, here to... You know, to the creator, to the supreme God of the universe. And it was considered a gift to God. And so Hannah fulfilled her vow, her vow, this one to deity, to the God, as well as she followed that ancient Near Eastern tradition. But the thing was, with this ancient Near Eastern tradition was that the that the first male child, even though it was considered to belong to deity uh, amongst the Israelites, it meant that consecrating, uh, sorry, it also meant that consecrating and transferring the child to the temple was for holy use, but they could later be redeemed. But in Hannah's case, did she redeem the child? Or did she keep him there, allow him to serve God for life? Her, her vow was for life. And so Hannah chose not to redeem him and consecrate him there for life. Today, many women are seemingly barren for various reasons. And many mothers are praying or have prayed. But continue to be faithful. Women continue to be faithful whether they've had that child or not. Faithful whether it's to God or to their partner or in different ways. And yet some are barren because they have needed, because their children have left home or left the Lord. And so there's a different kind of barrenness that can be experienced with that. And yet... And yet these women, who are godly women, would then be praying and consecrating their children to God. Consecrating their children to God. We're not told how many tears would have been cried by Hannah. And yet at the same time she would have been comforted that, she was, that her son was in God's care. If your child has left walking with the Lord, 
may you be comforted today. May you be comforted today that there's a God who cares, that there is a God who cares for you as well as for your children. Keep praying for them. Keep praying. How do Hannah's actions foreshadow God or reflect God or reveal Him? Firstly, God the Father gave His, His, His first and only Son and consecrated Him for life. For an incredible mission. He consecrated him so you and I could be redeemed and restored to our rightful places to have that restored relationship with our, our Heavenly Father again. So that we could be restored and redeemed. Hannah's name, the second point is, how is God revealed? Hannah's name means grace. And it's through Jesus Christ that we've been given favour with God and access to His grace for our salvation. What a beautiful God. A God of grace and everlasting un um, and bountiful love. The third point, Hannah's story takes us from pain. We live in a life of pain. We are... Uh, it, as children and into our adult years, there's pain. But the beautiful thing is Hannah's story takes us from pain to joy, just as God can take our pain and heal us and take us to joy. And God and God's plan of salvation is exactly that. So that the pain that we experience in this life can be taken away forever and we can have the everlasting joy with our Father and Jesus Christ in heaven. What a beautiful God. And the fourth thing about Hannah is fulfill, fulfilling her vow to God, God brought Hannah much joy as it does to God with fulfilling his vow, that vow of the everlasting covenant. And that vow is there for all of us to experience. What a mighty God we serve. And then the third one. I'm sorry, this is another picture here of Nazareth today too. And then so our third one. Our third one is the spiritual mother. Naomi. Naomi, turn back with your Bibles just to the book right before 1 Samuel, to Ruth chapter 1. The book of Ruth chapter 1. And, 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 and there's pockets of all of this through all of Ruth. And so I'm just going to touch on a few verses as we look at all four chapters just briefly on a few verses. And in the book of Ruth, what we see, who we see, is this amazing Israelite woman living in Israel in the days when the judges ruled. So around about 1300 to, to 1050 BC or so. And the Israelites lived in Canaan at, at, a, at the time when there were no kings ruling over them. But the judges ruled. And here we see the story of a lady by the name of Naomi. And she, she's introduced to us in verses 1 and 2. It comes here in Ruth 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judge ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of, man, of the man was Elimelech. The name of the wife was Naomi. And the names of his sons were Marlon and, and Chilion. Ephratites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and they remained there. And here's verse 3. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And verse 4, Now they took wives of the women of Moab, and the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was who? Who was the other one's name? Ruth. My sister's name is Ruth. What a beautiful name. And so we see here, we're introduced to Naomi. 
to Naomi and she goes to the deepest possible pain that one could experience. Her husband dies. Then her son dies and the other son dies. And imagine the depth of pain and grief that Naomi would have experienced. We can try and imagine, but maybe it's beyond our imagination. But let's take our mind to that pain. Because here's the thing. What happens is the sons then choose two daughters, and one of them is Opa and the other one is Ruth. And then, despite the fact that, that Naomi has these two daughters-in-law, she has no one from her own flesh and blood. And what happens, she's still caught in her pain, and so she decides she wants to go back to Bethlehem and as she goes back she tells these two daughter-in-laws to head back to their own own uh, to, to remain and not follow with her and to remain and it meant that they also would go back to worshipping their own gods and not the God of Israel that Naomi and others would, would be worship that um, they would have learnt in worshipping you know being in that family but here we find that Ruth says to her in verse 14 they lifted up their voices and wept again, and, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. <coughs> and then Naomi says to him in verse 15, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Plural. Gods. <coughs> One God. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said to him in verse 16, and some of these are some of the key words I want to read out. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And then verse 17 ends with, If anything but death parts you and me. And so they go back. They go back. <coughs> and then what we find, sorry, I thought I had one more slide there. I think the one before, yes, that, that one there, sorry, was earlier. I had them in the wrong order. But this photo here is what Bethlehem looks like today. That wouldn't have been what it looked like in the time of Jesus. But here what we see with this spiritual mother, Naomi then takes her under her wing and being an Israelite and knowing God and following God, she becomes Ruth's spiritual mother. And then what we find, is, and if you keep reading that story, it goes through in chapter 3, we find, um, we find there that um, uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more, more kindness at the end of the beginning and, and in that you did not go after young men, whether, you put, whether poor or rich. But she ends up, and this is Boaz saying to her, because she then ends up being marrying Boaz, who is, of course, the relative of, of Naomi's deceased husband. And what happens here is that Ruth gives birth to a male child. <coughs> to a male child, who then, of course, begins the lineage towards the King David and the lineage of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful story. A real story, not just made up story. And so Naomi, this spiritual mother who lost those of her own flesh and blood becomes a spiritual mother and not only that, she becomes the ancestor of the incarnate Son of God. How is God reflected through Naomi? Naomi got to experience the joy of motherhood as a spiritual mother and later into her grandmotherhood. And there are some who may have lost children or in the, in the case of my case, never had children. But you can be a spiritual mother to one child, to ten children, to more. And when we lived out at Burke and we had the church plant in Brewarina with the Aboriginal children, <coughs> and people would commonly ask me, how many children do you have? And I would say, 
30. Mm. I have 30 children. Because that's what it was. Mm. And even today, the lady that is now the pastor of the church there, of this Aboriginal church, Pine Bawarina, her mother, even before before this, this lady became baptised and, 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 and now is the pastor, her mother would call me her spiritual mother. Her own mother would say, go to Danuta, that's your spiritual mother. And the first time I heard that, I was like, I didn't know how to take it, but I thought, there is a place. There is a place, whether you have children or no children, to be a spiritual mother. And to dads, I say, you can be a spiritual dad. You can be a spiritual dad too. And here's the other thing. God's constant love and who he is takes us from despair to hope, from pain to joy. And he offers us the best that we can ever, ever be offered in this world of anything, of anyone. And so despite her grief, despite the depth of pain, Naomi moved forward and she paved the way with Ruth's redemption through Boaz. And through that, her own family line was redeemed. And so God can use you to redeem a child in need. And God is working out our redemption and restoration always. Always. So how do we wrap this up together? Each mother reveals God to us in different ways. From childbearing mothers <clears throat> who show sacrifice like that Jochebed in so many ways, show God because he sacrificed his one and only son. Who the, and to the praying mothers, faithful mothers, who have consecrated their children, <coughs> whether they're barren, barren or have children or have had children, but they have left for whatever reason, walked away from the Lord. They show that God gave his one and only son so that we might be redeemed and restored through Jesus Christ, that we have been given favour with God and access to his grace for our salvation. And then the third one, like Naomi, those who may, uh, who who can be spiritual mothers, and to dads who can be spiritual dads, all that, show that God made a promise, an everlasting promise, and He paved the way for you and I, for our redemption. These women and many more mentioned in the Bible paved the way for all motherhood in every format. Whether biological, fostering, adoption, mentoring, guiding, spiritually guiding any other child. Every woman and every man within the Bible and everyone for us. Every man and woman plays an important role in the generations to come. May God bless each one of us in whatever our role is. In whatever place God has placed you in. That, that his love, his unfailing love, his sacrifice, his faithfulness to us can be revealed through us to others is my prayer today.